Good morning, everyone. Um, I need to start by making a correction to my Monday lecture. I have made a grave error. Um, I have misled you into thinking I'm much cooler than I am. Uh, when I gave you the example of Tom and Stephen, and I said, do you all know Tom Holland? And you all said, yeah, we do. Um, it didn't even cross my mind that you meant Tom Holland as in Spider-Man or Zendaya's <laughs> boyfriend. <laughs> I don't know what you understood of my he has a great podcast uh, line afterwards. What I meant was Tom Holland, not movie star. He does not have a face for the movies. He does have a good face for podcasts. Um, <laughs> he's a professor at Cambridge, a professor of history at Cambridge. Um, and I do truly recommend his podcast. No offense to Tom Holland and Spider-Man and all that, but that's not who I meant. So I'm not as cool as I thought, as you thought. Uh, that's the first correction I have to make today. Um, <laughs> so the topic of the lecture this morning is free trade versus protectionism, and it does follow what we talked about on Monday. If you've paid a bit of attention at your schedule today, you will see that actually the lectures starting today start to look a bit more applied. So you've covered the theory part of the discussion, and now you're looking at more the political economy, the applied aspects of Austrian economics. So this lecture is no exception. What we're going to be doing today is I'm going to take you a little bit through the history of free trade. I should perhaps call it the history of international trade because we don't really have, we haven't really had free trade at any point in time. And I'm very possessive of the term free trade because I would like it kept for what it should really be rather than what we have right now and is generally easily called free trade because we tend to confuse matters and we tend to then discover that free trade doesn't work, but in fact, we do not have free trade. So what we should really say is managed trade doesn't work. So I will try to take you a little bit through what has happened in the 19th, 20th, 21st century so far. Um, how the two world wars impacted um, global um, trade, what has been the rhetoric and what has been the reality of trade policy, um, where do we stand at this point in time, why trade agreements don't work, please note, not free trade agreements, which is what they're usually called, why trade agreements don't work, um, and what is it that we could do? Where could we place our hope, our efforts? Where do we have most strategic leverage, if you want, in bringing about free trade? Where should we concentrate um, our efforts in the future if we want to champion this fight? Um, Mises himself was a, um, as you, I'm sure you know, an advocate of free trade, and he was involved in a lot of free trade movements at the time, and I'll come back to this throughout the lecture but he very easily became disillusioned with what was happening at the time, and I think we are going through a very similar situation uh, right now. So if I were to take a snapshot of where we stand when we talk about the doctrine of free trade, I think Tausig's statement still very much applies. The doctrine does hold its own in the sphere of intellect, so if you ask mainstream economists and so on, they'll say, absolutely, free trade is more beneficial than autarky. The comparative advantage, the law of comparative advantage is true. However, it is thoroughly rejected in the world of politics. It's one of those situations where, yeah, that's great. That works in theory. However, in practice, we cannot really have free trade. We cannot afford to have free trade. We have strategic sectors that need to be protected. We have infant industries that need to be protected and so on. And generally, it's a very emotional topic, free trade. Again, for politicians as well and for the general public. So, and even for scholars who, again, accept the doctrine as being true, but when it comes to actually applying it in practice, will find themselves very hard pressed to really allow a laissez-faire approach and to say the government should step out of international trade altogether. I want to say something in defense of the public here being ambiguous on the benefits of free trade. If you think about it from the point of view of someone who works in an industry for which tariffs, let's say, are removed, and as a result of the removal of those tariffs, that industry disappears from that geographical area. 
that is a cost that they can see right away. The fact that they have lost their jobs, the fact that the city or the town they used to live in has disappeared, um, that is a cost that they feel directly. When it comes to the benefits of free trade, a general rise in the standard of living, maybe the re-specialization of those factors of production in other areas or um, of the same, of the, of the, the labor re-specializing into other areas, those beneficial effects take longer to take place. They might not accrue directly to the people who have lost their jobs. And most importantly, there are so many domestic policies that prevent those benefits from occurring in the first place. Because yes, liberalizing a certain industry, let's say, to foreign trade will bring about a, a net benefit over the standard of living. But if it's coupled with increases in taxes, let's say, or credit expansion and so on, those benefits will not be felt by the public. So I've grown to be a lot more understanding to the general, to the public opinion when it comes to not immediately buying into the fact that free trade is beneficial. And I do think that here it is important to be strategic in the way that we present these benefits and understanding that for, um, for a particular person in a particular context, those benefits might not be immediately visible. Again, if we are to take a snapshot, when we do talk about free trade, generally the discussion is carried beyond yeah, national borders. So yes, it's great to have maybe free trade. We want to lower tariffs and so on and so forth. But within national borders, the discussion is never about more liberalization. So there's a bit of a disconnect between what happens in domestic matters and what happens in international matters. And if you remember from Monday, we talked about the fact that there shouldn't be a distinction, that there isn't a distinction between the phenomenon of trade within national borders and outside national borders. And we will talk throughout the lecture today about different trade policies and so on, but again, the discussion is very muddled. It's become less frequent that we hear the terms free trade and more likely you hear things like fair trade, yeah, or managed trade and so on. So a very muddy picture if we were to, um, to look at how things look like today. I did include the term there of vibonomics. Does anybody know what vibonomics are? Have you heard it? So I've heard it only a few months ago, and apparently it's trending. Uh, again, my feeble attempts to appear cool. Um, it's been brought up particularly in discussion to Biden's campaign and the fact that um, although macroeconomic indicators seem to have been improving, the Biden administration was unable to get this across to the general public and to say, well, actually, you should be feeling better. And the general public saying, but we're not feeling better. Um, we have a bad vibe about the economy. Um, so I just wanted to point out that free trade has been suffering through these sort of vibonomics for, before it was cool uh, for the Biden administration to bring it up. Um, yeah, the idea is that people do have a bad vibe about international trade. It's not warranted, as it is in the case of the Biden administration, by the way. It's not warranted, but it's there, and we have to be aware of it before we promote the benefits of free trade in a way that sort of disregards the genuine concerns that people have. Has it always been this way? Pretty much. Um, you'd be hard-pressed to find um, a truly free uh, period of exchanges. But we did have a golden age of free trade in the second half of the 19th century. And this is, was due to the efforts of some very politically savvy individuals, in the good sense politically savvy, some true classical liberals, particularly Richard Cobden in England and Michel Chevalier in France. They were good friends, and they worked together tirelessly to convince Napoleon III, who was rather reluctant to reforms and more open to revolutions, um, to convince him to sign a, a trade agreement between Britain and France, particularly to lower French tariffs on British goods. And... They, they did manage to get this agreement signed. This reduced the tariff barriers between Britain and France at the time by 30%, which led to um, trade flows between the two countries doubling in size. 
And I will point out here, and I'll come back again, that when this agreement was signed, Cobden had already done the legwork in, in England and had managed to actually reduce British tariffs before it even presented this opportunity to the French government. Keep that in mind because I will come back to that point. So this was indeed a, uh, um, a period of flourishing free trade and things looked like they would be going in the direction that classical economists would have envisioned. But um, this was not the case um, throughout the world. And um, really, by the end of the 19th century, French, France had retrenched uh, back to its more protectionist stance. By the 1930s in the US, um, you had the uh, Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which came in the wake of the Great Depression and prolonged the Great Depression, of course. Um, when duties on imports became 53% and then 59% in 1932. And this led, I think, for the U.S. to a drop in trade volumes by about 70% and world trade volumes during that period by 25%. Of course, this was not due solely to the um, tariffs. There were other um, economic issues at, at play, but obviously the tariffs did not help at all. So what we really saw in the beginning of the 20th century was a, um, a disintegration of the world economic order, as it had been known before um, the First World War and before the Great Depression. The interwar period was, again, a very convoluted, very tumultuous uh, period. The Second World War really sort of settled um, the discussion, if you want, as in does the old word order work anymore? It does not. We need a new economic order. And in this new economic order, free trade and laissez-faire were completely decoupled. Um, and as Razin Salib points out, free trade became um, seen as a first best intervention in correcting the domestic market failures. Um, I do recommend Razin Salih's uh, work on this. He does a lot of work on multilateral and bilateral trade agreements. We also had a lot of countries emerging from the, well, particularly the British colonial empire. And as they were um, emerging in their newfound independence, they embraced a lot of mercantilist ideas. They thought that exporting raw material as, and exporting agricultural products was somehow detrimental to their economies. Um, they were keen to industrialize their economies. And as a result, they were keen to protect their domestic economies and willing to do these through heavy tariffs and quotas and subsidies. And if we are to be honest, I don't think mercantilist thought really fully disappeared at any point in time. In history, classical economists did very much to destroy uh, the validity of mercantilist arguments in terms of theory, but politically it has always held a certain appeal and it, it always rears its ugly head in one way or another, even today. But I think the main thing that happened in the 20th century that had the greatest detrimental effect on trade was the fact that we saw a complete disintegration of the world monetary system. And if you remember on Monday, I keep pestering you on the fact that money prices are an integral part of the division of labor in the sense that they provide those absolutely essential signals for knowing how specialization should occur. So obviously, if you think about globally how important money prices and sound currencies are, to stable, predictable, healthy global trade flows. But this was not the case during the 20th century. So back in 1922, at the Genoa conference, central banks came together and started to coordinate their efforts in terms of credit expansion to figure out a way to prevent gold flows out of the country. Their dream came closer to reality with the gold exchange standard in 1944 and finally with the closing of the gold window in 1973, which allowed them to really taste the sweet taste of inflation without having to worry that gold would flow out of their country or that their international standing would in any way be affected. So that gave them the control over the monetary system, 
that countries started to have gave them increased control over what they could do in international trade. They no longer were held accountable to their trade partners and so on. So it really became a lot easier to do trade policy. So as I was saying, the interwar and the post-war periods um, in the 20th century have really been very tumultuous. And you can still see to this day this tendency to retrench from global economic relations and so on, and at the same time to have increased calls for global economic cooperation. I always find it to be a little of a dualistic approach. Yeah, we want to... Um, boost our national economies, we want to protect our national economies, but then we also very much like these very bureaucratic international cooperation agencies for whatever reason. Um, trade obviously is a very um, good candidate for these kinds of organizations. The general agreement on tariffs and trade went through seven rounds of negotiations between all the member states, and it actually wasn't very bad. Um, it did manage to bring down some of those tariffs that had um, mushroomed after the Second World, World War. But once the World Trade Organization came um, on scene, basically World Trade Organization, uh, World Trade negotiations have come to a standstill. Um, the Doha round um, was supposed to follow the Uruguay round. It has made absolutely no progress, and you can tell it has made no progress because they have renamed it as the Doha Development Agenda. Um, so now there should be no expectation that it would ever make any kind of progress anymore. Um, and the reason for this is that you have, in the WTO, if I remember correctly, you have 164 member countries. That's 164 at minimum interest groups getting to the table together and trying to agree on liberalization. It's not going to happen because every single country comes with a nationalistic agenda at the table. Now, these three people here witnessed the first calls for international economic cooperation and were very prescient in warning about the dangers of substituting this kind of bureaucratic um, approach to an ideology of free trade. They were the first ones to say, free trade is never going to work if we approach it with um, countries that want to be interventionist in their domestic affairs. That's never going to work. International cooperation is never going to bring about the results that we are looking for. Do you know who these people are? Well, Mises, yeah, okay. Uh, do you know who? I mean, I'll, I'll give it to you that the bottom picture isn't great, but I haven't found another picture of him, if anybody ever finds it at some point. So the person at top, that's Wilhelm Rapke. His name is, his name is right there. He was a uh, German economist. He lived most of his life in Switzerland, and I think he is um, widely credited with the Germany's economic uh, miracle, um, as an advisor, I believe, to Konrad Adenauer. Um, the person on the bottom, that's Michael Heilperin. He was also a very good friend of Mises. They worked together, Robke, Mises, and Heilperin, at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva for a few years. Um, Mises and Robke got their immigration papers to the U.S. about the same time, and they um, pondered together together. Um, whether they should uh, they should immigrate. Mises decided to come to the U.S. Robke stayed in Switzerland. I think he was too high on the um, Nazis' wanted list to, to really be able to escape, to leave. Halperin went to California, taught in France, and think, spent a lot of his time in Switzerland as well, and I think was Mises' first guest for a um, tour in the countryside once Mises got his driver's license. Um, and apparently Mises was a very bad driver, uh, if you didn't know that. Um, Dr. Hilsman told me that, so I... Um, so they were working together during this time, during the late 1930s uh, in Geneva. And if you read their writings, you will see that all three of them have, as I, as I mentioned, a really prescient um, 
view over what is going to happen with all these international um, efforts for economic cooperation, for free trade, and so on. And the rest of the lecture is going to be spent talking about um, what has really happened then. And I'm going to show you a lot of their um, um, multiple quotes from their works, um, just so you can truly appreciate how um, tremendous it must be um, to be them and to be able to force to see so clearly into the future and to understand the causes at work um, at that time. But before I do that, let me just um, very briefly tell you what's happening now in the 21st century. So really after, um, after the 1990s, I think the greatest change in global trade flows has been um, brought about by the rise of Asian economies. So we're talking China and India and Southeast Asia. These were those countries that I mentioned a few moments ago had embraced those mercantilist ideals. A um, couple of decades later, they started to understand that actually maybe trade is not all about control, that maybe we can at least part of our economy, liberalize it. The efforts to industrialize weren't bringing about the results that they were expecting. So when they started to, even to a lukewarm degree, open their borders to international trade, their, um, I think they almost doubled the workforce, the global workforce, um, and um, they've effectively shifted the center of gravity in terms of world trade from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Um, and again, and that, that happened with, a, um, with not a total liberalization, either of their domestic economy of their, or their international economy, but the positive effects of that have been absolutely tremendous. Um, I have a quote here um, from Mises that didn't quite make it into the slides, but I promised that I would read it to you. In terms of um, who was it to blame that it took so long for these countries like China and India and Southeast Asia and even today African countries, why is it that it took them so long and it's still taking them so long to understand that the benefits of free trade come from liberalization, that trade shouldn't be about capital controls and it shouldn't be about regulation. And I think if you ask a mainstream economist, it would tell you, well, they are in this predicament due to their colonial past, and it's Europe and America who are to blame. They've exploited their natural resources. They haven't helped them industrialize and so on. In an essay called The Plight of Underdeveloped Nations, Mises has a slightly different explanation for this. And he says, these countries wanted to nationalize before they had permitted businesses to build plants and enterprises which could be expropriated. They wanted to establish a new fair deal when their distress consisted precisely in the fact that they had not had what is today disparaged as the old and unfair deal. The radical intellectuals in these countries blame Europe and America for the backwardness and poverty of their people. They are right but for reasons which are very different from those they themselves have in mind. Europe and America did not cause the plight of, the, of these nations, but they have prolonged its duration. By implanting in their intellectuals the ideologies which are the most serious obstacle to any improvement of conditions, the socialists and interventionists of the West have poisoned the mind of the East. And I think that is the kernel of the explanation of why we do not have free trade today. Free trade is not a matter of bureaucracy. It's not a matter of policy or political um, achievements. It's a matter of ideology. And when you have an ideological approach like Smith abroad and Keynes at home, this is effectively a recipe for disaster. We know what the approach of Keynes at home brings, but even when we talk about Smith abroad, really we cannot look at the history of world trade and say it has been anything um, that has resembled really re liberalizing um, international exchanges. So what we have now, we have trade that is very erratic, and I'll come back to this in a minute. We have greater discontinuity in time. We have the universal adoption of, universe, uh, of inflationary monetary policies. I think those are Robke's words, if I'm not mistaken. So you have 
on the one hand, all of these calls for cooperation, now they're not called simply the World Trade Organization anymore and something like that. We have things like mega regional trade agreements because they sound better, don't they? Um, but generally, those are complemented by a turning of the tide. You have trade wars, you have nationalism, you have... Um, sanctions as it happened in the conflict with Russia and Ukraine and so on. So you have a very volatile, very unpredictable uh, international trade um, arena. And you have trade policy. We've always had trade policies. And I thought, before I go and I tell you what the solution is to this, that we would take a little moment to, to diagnose um, or to understand how trade policy um, looks like. There's different types of arguments for why we need to protect our domestic economies. They tend to fall under three categories, so either economic or political or ethical. Economic arguments are... Um, the type of the infant industry argument. So we have industries that are in their infancy. They just need a little bit of protection for a short period of time so that they can develop and then they will be liberalized. You would not be surprised that the steel industry in the United States has been an infant industry since its infancy. Up to the present day, it, it is still an infant and shall remain an infant forever. Um, they never go away. So the, the infant industry protection never goes away. I'm yet to find an example where this argument, this economic argument for trade policy has been used and then it has been scaled back where governments have said, okay, now they're not an infant anymore. They can go and do. It has never happened. Political arguments are generally the kind that relate to strategic um, trade sectors. So, okay, we can't really allow other countries to supply us with um, guns and ammunition, right? That's a strategic sector. Um, what about the energy sector? That's a strategic sector. We need to be self-reliant in those areas as well. And you can see there the subtle threat of war. So whenever they talk about these strategic sectors, what they really mean is in the case of a war, we need to be able to have control over these sectors so we can ensure our survival. Um, Again, energy and um, defense are your classical examples, but I think as technology develop, uh, develops, you'll end up having things like AI-capable data centers becoming uh, strategic sectors, so they will fall under the area of protection as well. And then you have ethical arguments, things like labor laws, um, child labor laws. Yeah, we cannot... Um, import goods from countries which have sweatshops or we cannot import goods from countries where the labor laws or the human rights aren't respected and so on. Now, depending on these arguments, and I will have to say that these days governments don't really feel the need to justify their trade policy to the same degree that they used to. They just, they just kind of go ahead and do it. But you have different trade roles, so different administrations will decide to be more passive and have an approach of benign neglect. This is basically the best you can hope for these days, where they will keep things as they are. Maybe they will reduce tariffs. Um, maybe they will, um, again, they'll take a passive approach to what is happening internationally. The, some governments will take a defensive approach. Uh, I'll give you an example of the European Union in just a minute. And you can see that the discussions now in the context of the U.S. elections are more about being more active or more aggressive in terms of our trade policy. And then you have different strategic approaches as a government. You can go for something called a modified market approach where you look at what's happening in the market. If you remember the discussion on Monday, you say, I don't like what's happening in the market. I don't like what we're trading or to the prices that we're trading and so on. So we're going to impose tariffs, quotas, subsidies, maybe red tape barriers and other regulations to modify what's happening in that market. You have a case-by-case -case approach. Again, this relates to, for example, strategic sectors. So, okay, we're only going to target, let's say, the um, generative AI tools and the technology that comes with that. We're going to maybe invest a lot more in those areas. And then the more 
openly political uh, strategies, the geopolitical approach or the approach of economic warfare. Again, you've seen this um, in its clearest form, I think, when it came to the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the sanctions that were applied to Russia and so on, or the discussions between America and China and um, imposing tariffs in order to really geopolitically target um, a, uh, an enemy. So if that's trade policy, sorry, had you finished taking all the notes from it, um, I'm sure you can go back and, and, and do it. Um, so do trade agreements not work then? Okay, we have these trade policies and they are cumbersome and they modify the signals that entrepreneurs get in the market and so on. But could we not say that um, maybe trade agreements are a good thing? Because there's a lot of them. They've been proliferating in the last few years. Really, these, whenever these trade agreements work, they work because the governments have agreed to trade favors. Yeah, so the ones that really work are the ones that are regional or bilateral. Uh, Razin Salih calls them trade light tools of foreign policy. A little bit of trade, but really what we're really doing is exchanging favors, exchanging protectionism. I will allow you to protect um, the um, steel industry if you will allow me to protect um, a, a different industry at the same time. Yeah. Multilateral agreements, the likes that are discussed at the World Trade and Organization, do not really work. One, because they cannot enforce what is put in the agreement. So again, we commit to reducing our tariffs by 2% in the next 10 years. What happens if we don't? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They have, um, I mean, just to give you an example, it takes it takes anywhere between five and 15 years to become a member of the WTO. Can you imagine their dispute resolution settlement uh, system, how effective that is, yeah? And whenever these um, trade agreements come into place, they are thousands of pages long. NAFTA, which I think is one of the shortest ones, is about 2,000 pages, but the mega trade Pacific partnerships and so on, they're basically thousands of pages of regulations for how to support certain industries or areas that we are friends with and how to uh, dampen trade in areas that we do not want um, to encourage. So even if sometimes they will say we have reduced tariffs by one or two percent, what has really happened in the background is that those tariff reductions have been simply replaced by non tariff barriers by red tape. And these are a lot more detrimental than tariffs. On the one hand, tariffs are really easy for entrepreneurs to comprehend. It's a tax. They don't really, the, the, the ones that are exporting are and bearing the costs is your own consumers that are bearing the costs, and that's absolutely fine. But they're a lot less discriminatory because they apply to absolutely everybody. However, red tape barriers can be very specifically discriminatory. So they can create trade flows in channels that the government likes and can prevent trade flows from channels that governments don't like. And so as a result, they create economic rents. If you are a producer, you will be spending a lot of the resources that you could spend on producing valuable things for the economy in convincing the governments to give you benefits in lobbying the governments to get into these trade agreements so you can gain from that. So don't be blinded by the fact that if you search for what's the average tariff rate and so on, and it looks like it has gone down, that doesn't mean we have liberalized trade at all. If anything, it means that underneath there are a lot more non-tariff and red tape barriers that prevent um, trade from happening. So I said I was going to give you quotes, and here they come. Um, the, those are quotes from Mises and Ropke in 1942 and in 1944, describing what commercial treaties should do. They should specify the general conditions of trade. They should be a means of abolishing step-by-step -step trade barriers and all other measures of discrimination. And what they really are now, according to Ropket, they're a matter of mutual, mutual arrangement between governments diverted into the directions demanded by an economic nationalism. 
Governments are eager to overreach each other in negotiations and value a treaty in proportion as it hindered the other nation's export and seemed to encourage one's own. Can I just point out this is 1944? Could have been written yesterday, and it couldn't have been written by me, so it's fantastic. But what I want to say also is not just that we have really moved from one way of doing trade agreements or trade policy or trade barriers to something that's more sophisticated. If anything, governments have become a lot more petty. And I have a great pleasure in sort of following the kind of areas that these trade agreements or trade regulations really target. Because a lot of my students live with the impression that it's all about strategic sectors. They'll think, well, yes, but Surely the governments should care about the energy sector. They should care about guns and ammunition and what if a war happens. Those are serious problems. You really want to know what the U European Union and the UK government are focused on? So domestically, for example, we've had bans on plastic straws, uh, menthol cigarettes, microbeads, very important, tariffs on walking sticks, whips and riding crops, but we are excluding toy umbrellas. That's very important, very strategic. Um, the European Union has something called a banana stabilization mechanism. It's a quota. <laughs> They're trying to make sure that the uh, imports of bananas um, from Colombia and Peru in particular don't go over about a certain uh, quantity. And if they do, they impose a very, um, very high tax. Uh, it goes the same for garlic, fresh or chilled, and so on. And I've just seen in the Financial Times only a couple of days ago that they are already planning what to do in case Trump wins and decides to impose tariffs. Talk about sort of the defensive um, trade approach. Um, apparently, they have a two-step um, trade policy plan. Um, they will um, approach Trump with a, with a proposal to buy goods in larger quantities, whatever that means. Or if he refuses, they have a plan of targeted um, tariffs for goods imported from the United States with duties of 50% or more. Um, and these goods include bourbon whiskey, Harley Davidson motorcycles. It should say power boats there. I think something's happened. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the UK, but there's no room to put a power boat anywhere. I have no idea what they're planning um, to do. But what I, what I want to bring up to you is that there's a great amount of resources being spent on trade policy, bureaucratic resources, uh, taxpayers' money. And again, I don't want you to live under the impression that, well, at least they're focusing on important issues. They tend to be very, very petty, very small. And again, it's all about um, appeasing those um, special interest groups. So international trade agreements, they're now the counterpart of an elaborate system of internal interventionism, one of the most important pieces of the formidable machinery of managed capitalism. Just mindful of the time, my impeccable timing from Mondays have gone away, so I just want to make sure that I do cover a little bit more uh, of what I wanted to say to you today. So we are going now through something that Robke called the hand-to-mouth character of world trade. So what governments do through trade agreements, through monetary policy, through trade policy, is they channel trade away from economically efficient channels into politically efficient channels. And what those channels are, are extremely volatile, extremely unstable, extremely inefficient. Malinvestments happen domestically and internationally. And I think there's an advanced seminar later um, in the week by um, Dr. Engelhardt that will um, possibly touch on this. He hasn't told me yet, so I'm speculating. But um, if malinvestments happen on an international scale the way they happen domestically, and bad investments and bad trade deals happen all the time, and they happen because the government re um, channels trade from the directions it would go if it were allowed to follow the pattern of comparative advantage to politically expedient 
uh, channels. So that is why we are not seeing the benefits of global trade. That's why you'll see, oh, there's an increase in global trade. And you'll think, well, shouldn't that bring about an increase in the standard of living? And it cannot because it is not the increase that it should have happened. It is not the increase that should have occurred in line with the most effective specialization. Um, I cannot go through um, this fantastic quote in as much detail as I would like, but please do um, come and I can... Um, I can recommend the particular books uh, of Rob Mises and Halperin on this as well. So what is it that we can do? Should we abandon all hope? Um, if trade and free, if free trade should follow domestic policy, then we should follow, we should focus on liberalizing in domestic affairs. So free trade is not a top-down process. We will not be able to obtain free trade by putting our efforts in these international cooperation uh, initiatives, whether they're trade agreements or organizations and so on. Because as Mises said, you cannot repra replace an ideology with a bureaucracy. We need a free trade ideology. And in order to have a free trade ideology, we need a domestic laissez-faire ideology. So all our efforts should go into liberalizing our domestic affairs and free trade will follow from that. Yeah, free trade is the handmaiden of peace and it's only pre peace and, um, and laissez-faire that will bring about free trade. And then reciprocity will follow. I said I will come back to the Cobden Chevalier um, treatment. A lot of the discussion these days when it comes to uh, multilateral trade agreements um, focuses on expecting our trade partners to lower their tariffs as well. But really, the benefits of trade come from a country lowering its tariffs itself. It, they come from unilateral liberalization. Of course, if our trade pa uh, partners liberalize as well, the benefits increase. But if they do not, we still benefit from what we have liberalized. And this is exactly what Cobden knew in 1859, which is to, to avow total indifference whether other nations became free traders or not, but abolish protection for our own selves and leave other countries to take whatever course they liked best. So I'm just going to say that the evidence shows strongly that whatever strides were made in international trade over the last century were done by countries unilaterally getting rid of tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and so on. And I have a fantastic example from January this year when Switzerland decided to abolish, abolish, not reduce, not tweak, not change, abolish, all tariffs on imports of industrial products, so the only thing that that excludes are live animals, plants, or seeds. They're expecting something like a one billion um, reduction in the net fiscal burden in the next year. It took them about three years to get the policy through. Um, but the what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the length of the decision is about a page long. That's all it took. We don't need 10,000 pages of international trade agreements. One page that simply says, from January 1st, 2024, Switzerland no longer has any tariffs on any industrial goods. So there's hope. And that's the quote from Halperin that I want to uh, leave you with, which is the challenge and the hope for the future of international trade is whether we can learn something from the tumultuous history it has had in the last couple of centuries. Thank you so much.